Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's 2017 Fall Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne coming to you from Michigan State University and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar entitled EAB Management and Pollinator Safety. Our speaker today is Ohio State University entomologist Reed Johnson. Dr. Johnson was an EAB University presenter on this subject two years ago, and we are happy that he has agreed to return to share his expertise as well as any updated information from his research. Before we get started, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally over the top of your screen. We will make a note of the questions and we'll have Reed respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, I will be mail emailing a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that I hope you will take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. I will also put these instructions in the email that I send you. Certificates will be emailed to you within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today. And Reed, please share your screen with your presentation and we'll get started. All, All right. right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So, I, as Robin said, I'm just going to give an update of the presentation that I gave a couple of years ago on the exposure and effects of these emerald ash borer treatments on pollinators. And this is uh, kind of a continuing project with uh, with Dan Herms, who just recently uh, left our department uh, here at Ohio State, as well as a, uh, an excellent uh, College of Worcester uh, biology undergraduate student, um, my uh, postdoc, now research scientist, Chia Lin, and uh, graduate student, Rodney Richardson, who was really the one that, that made the uh, key discovery that the bees in Ohio really are foraging on ash pollen and that this is a relevant topic uh, to study. And this was all funded um, in part by the, uh, the Pollinator Partnerships Corn Dust Research Consortium and the Ohio State Beekeepers Association. So um, I'm really interested in bee toxicology and how different uh, toxic things that bees encounter can have effect on bees. Um, and because bees actually do come into contact with a wide range of, of toxic compounds, not just the pesticides that you probably think of, but there are a lot of toxic things present in, uh, you know, in the in the nectar and the, the pollen they consume, or in the uh, microorganisms that grow in that stuff, um, or in the treatments that the beekeepers use to control the varroa mites within the colony. And so, a toxic exposure can have a whole range of effects on bees, anything from from no effect all the way up to catastrophic effect. Um, and this is really the the foundation of toxicology is that the dose makes the poison. And you know it's possible to have a very small dose of something that has no effect. Um, but that very same compound, if present in very large quantity, could have a, a catastrophic, uh, deadly effect. And a classic example of this is like a cyanide. You know, cyanide is a very poisonous gas, but it's present in very small amounts in, you know, like almond extract. 
Um, and in that context, it doesn't really pose a problem. So the, the formal way to deal with this, this issue of the dose makes the poison is in this risk relationship. Uh, and that's that risk equals hazard times exposure. So we're going to look at these different um, components of risk and how emerald ash borer treatments may or may not pose a risk to honeybees by looking, breaking this up into the hazard and the exposure components. And so hazard could be the intrinsic toxicity of these emerald ash borer treatments. And as we'll see, they are actually quite toxic to bees. So that the hazard is definitely there. Then the question is, are bees actually exposed to these treatments? And number one, do bees collect ash pollen to begin with? Because if there's no intersection between bees and, uh, and ash trees, then there's gonna be no exposure and the risk will be zero. And then if bees do collect ash pollen, then the question is, what is the concentration of that insecticide in the ash pollen bees are collecting? So the, this is gonna be the structure of what I'm gonna show you over the next uh, 40 minutes here is the exposure and the hazard, and then we'll try to get at the risk really posed by these treatments to bees. Start with, do bees collect ash pollen? I guess I already kind of gave this away at the beginning, um, but this was kind of the, the, the product of an entirely separate project. We were not looking to see if bees were foraging on ash pollen. We were actually looking to see what bees were foraging on in agricultural landscapes around central Ohio uh, in the springtime during corn planting. Another uh, potential toxicological exposure for bees uh, because those corn seeds are coated with uh, insecticidal seed treatments. And there's really good evidence now that bees are, are dying um, from exposure to this dust when corn is being planted. Um, so here we, we set up six apiaries. This was in 2014 um, on, see here's Columbus over here on the right. Here's Dayton down here on the lower, uh, lower left. And we had some apiaries spread around central Ohio here. And there's, you know, if, it, if you drive through this landscape, it's not immediately clear what bees are foraging on at all and how they even manage to survive in this landscape because much of it looks just like this. It's uh, tilled fields, um, been herbicided, so there's no weeds growing in it. Um, there's just not a lot for bees to forage on in much of this landscape, uh, in this agricultural landscape. So here's one of our apiaries, and you can see this uh, really desolate field behind it about about to be uh, sown with corn. And, but you can begin to see what bees might be foraging on here. There are a few flowers and there's trees here that bees could potentially use in the, in the field margins. Um, so we, to figure out what bees are foraging on, we ask the bees. Um, and this is, um, bees have an amazing thing called floral fidelity, honeybees do anyway. And this is, was first observed by Aristotle, so it's difficult to find a reference more primary than this. Um, and Aristotle noted that on each expedition, the bee does not fly from a flower of one kind to a flower of another, but flies from one violet, say, to another violet, and never meddles with another flower until it got back to the hive. This was as true in Aristotle's time as it is today, and that honeybees really specialize on one type of flower when they go out to forage. Um, and so, you can collect, um, you can see what bees, individual bees are foraging on through the use of a pollen trap. And a pollen trap is this device on the bottom of this, uh, this colony here. And that, that pollen trap serves to collect the, the pollen that the bees accumulate on their, uh, their legs in pollen balls. Um, so here's an image of this pollen trap. We have a pollen trap in the on position, pollen trap in the or off position and the on position. And, and what this does is when it's on, it forces the bees to go through a series of uh, wire mesh, I think it's actually quarter inch wire mesh uh, overlaid on each other. And the bees have to squeeze through this mesh. And in the process of doing that, it scrapes the pollen balls off of the bees' legs and down into a, a, a drawer on the bottom of the, the device. And then you can just uh, open this drawer up and collect the pollen um, probably every three to four days is a good is a good period of time. That's what we did, um, and collect the pollen. And beekeepers actually use this device to to sell pollen. They can get uh, seven or eight dollars a pound uh, for this bee collected pollen because people want to buy it and eat it. But if you, as a as a data collector, 
collection device, this is fantastic because you can look at these balls that the bees are collecting and just visually see changes in their foraging over time. And you can see that each, the different colors in these pollen balls correspond to the different flowers that that individual bee was specializing on during this period that, that, that was traveling through the, the, the pollen trap. And so you can see April 12th, that's all this kind of yellowish pollen, and that graduates to this kind of gray-green pollen and this orange pollen. And then, you know, through the season, the, the, the color of the pollen the bees are bringing back really changes. And you can use this to infer which plants bees are using to, um, you know, provision the nest and to collect the, the pollen they use to consume and is really the, uh, the primary source of protein for the, the honeybee hive. So to identify pollen sources from this bulk pollen that we got out of this uh, uh, pollen trap, we, first off, we got huge amounts of pollen. We got like kilogram quantities in some cases. The, the bees are really hauling in the pollen this time of year. Um, so we took a subsample. We took a 10% subsample of this massive quantity of pollen. Um, and painstakingly sorted it by color uh, into different color fractions under a magnifying lens. Helps with that. And then we weighed each color category uh, to, to figure out its relative prevalence in the pollen sample. And then finally, after we had this, this sorted pollen, we prepared slides, uh, microscope slides, with this pollen on it so that we could determine what species each of these color fractions actually came from. From. Because if you look at, uh, if, you, if you make this pollen into a slurry uh, and put it on a stain with this basic fusion jelly that you see here, uh, put a little bit of pollen and water on that, you can then put it under the microscope and you can see there's really diverse morphology uh, of the, the pollen grains from these different plant types. So here we have a purple dead nettle, a mint was that brick red pollen. Here's dandelion, which was this, uh, this bright orange pollen, and that has this really spiky kind of appearance. Um, we found what we thought was ash pollen, um, just based on microscopy, and this was kind of surprising for us at the time because we didn't believe that bees foraged on ash pollen. And the rosaceous plants, um, like hawthorns and other fruit trees, um, were these more tan-colored pollens showed up a little later in the year. So this is how we initially determined what plants corresponded to these pollen balls, which corresponded to the, 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 the plants that bees were foraging on to sustain themselves. But you'll see that ash pollen shows up here. So just to, to show this to you, because I think it's really interesting how it, it changes, um, what, what bees are foraging on really changes drastically from site to site and from day to day over the course of the season as the bees reallocate their foraging effort um, depending on what is the most profitable pollen source at that particular time. So here we've got three sites, one, two, and three, and it's broken down by the sampling dates. And it's just uh, divided up by color. Here we've, uh, in green is the, the herbaceous plants, and then the woody plants are in the more red tones. And you can see this, this first site was really specializing on the herbaceous plants. These two lower sites were specializing on woody plants on the same dates. Um, and as you go through the um, foraging season, you'll see here we have hawthorn bloom, and, and we were interested in corn planting, so I've got that noted here, but that's not so important for this presentation. Um, and you see, as soon as the rosaceous trees start to bloom, the bees are really obsessed with uh, the fruit trees and the hawthorns, because apparently they're very good nectar and pollen sources, and the bees will forage on those um, to the point of ignoring other things that may be flowering during that time. And over the course of the season, you'll see that the, uh, at some point, the rosaceous trees start to um, give out and the bees go back to foraging on the herbaceous plants and other woody species. You'll see willow and uh, honeysuckle begin to be important uh, pollen uh, plants for the bees during this later time of this this period. I mean, it's amazing. This is just two weeks of, of foraging, really. Um, and there's, you know, all sorts of stories you could tell just from three different apiaries about what bees are foraging on and, and the variability between these things. So it, it really drives home the point that, that bees are foraging on a really diverse number of different things um, and forage on whatever is the best at the time. But you'll notice here that 
ash pollen made up a significant portion of the bee's diet in all three of these apiary sites um, during the early part of the season, during you know, late April and early May. And so here's all three of these sites combined, and you can see here that you know, ash pollen made up maybe 25% of the bee's diet during this week um, when the rosaceous trees were just really getting going. Now, in context of landscape, um, the percent of the, the pollen collected by weight, you can see that most of the pollen bees are collecting throughout this period were actually from woody trees and shrubs, not from the herbaceous dandelions and mints that we so commonly associate with, with bee foraging, that really the bees are up in the trees foraging on maples and oaks and ash during this time of year. And I guess the reason we don't give these trees the credit that they deserve is the fact that it's way up high and people generally are not looking at flowers that are um, you know, dozens of feet over their head, which is where the bees are undoubtedly collecting this pollen from. Um, just in terms of you know, the, the amount of landscape that was, was covered with this kind of um, woody um, kind of plant cover, in these agricultural sites, it was really a very small portion of the landscape. Most, I mean, this is an agriculture, these are agricultural sites. Most of the land, over 80% of it was in crop field. So the bees are really making their living off of these tiny slivers of roadsides, residential yards, and woodlots um, that are, are still out there and are not crop field. So, I mean, the amazing thing is that if you go out into this landscape this time of year, the first thing your eyes are drawn to is the abundant dandelions that are so obvious to us during the, uh, you know, this period. But the bees are only marginally interested in these dandelions that, that catch our eyes so much. The bees are actually interested up here in these trees, um, and that's where they're spending most of their time foraging, even though, as I mentioned before, we don't see them there. So. There was some question about whether this was really ash pollen um, that, that we had identified using microscopic methods. And I had a student in the lab who was really interested in finding new ways to identify pollen that the bees collect. So we took a new approach um, using DNA sequencing to, uh, first we amplified a, a, a metabarcode gene in the, in the DNA in these pollen grains and then used high throughput DNA sequencing to identify the plant that um, the, the pollen came from. And this is another way to identify pollen beyond microscopy because microscopy is extremely laborious and takes uh, quite a bit of expertise. So there's a real strong push among many labs now to make this sequencing approach work. So the, the procedure we, we uh, took for this was, again, we subsampled this large amount of pollen that we had collected. Uh, we homogenized it so we get a good representation of all the pollen types that are in there. Went through a DNA extraction step, uh, used PCR amplification to amplify um, this barcode sequence, and then went to the Illumina MySeq uh, sequencing platform to get uh, millions of reads of these, um, these uh, uh, DNA barcodes, and then process those reads using uh, bioinformatic tools, mainly blast alignment in the, in the case of this. this uh, the approach we took for this project, and did some analysis, and finally spit out a list of plant taxa uh, just based on DNA sequencing. And I mean, this, this is a really actively developing field, and, and our methods have actually changed quite a bit since we did this initial analysis. Um, we're, we're sequencing more barcode sequences now, um, because the problem with this is that microscopy and metabarcoding don't actually give you exactly the same results. Um, we can detect more plant species using the sequence-based approach than we can with microscopy, as you'd expect, because we're getting you know, hundreds of thousands of reads or millions of reads per sample, whereas microscopy, you might only be able to look at several hundred pollen grains. Um, but there are some things that you can't detect with metabarcoding, um, particularly um, willows are, are, can be quite problematic. Um, but over here, we've got the overlapping region that were, was detected by both metabarcoding and microscopy, and that includes uh, Olaceae, which is the family that contains uh, ash. And so 
we, we actually looked at that sequence much more closely because uh, we were interested in this ash question. And yes, bees are foraging on ash, and we have confirmed that through both microscopy results and DNA sequencing results. So I think it's safe to say at this point that um, we have really strong evidence that, that honeybees are foraging on ash pollen in central Ohio. Um, so that, I think, clears up the exposure component, um, that bees are collecting ash pollen, even though they have abundant other resources available at this time of year. Um, for whatever reason, ash continues to be a part of their diet in the places where ash is still abundant. So then the question is, on this exposure side of the equation, what is the insecticide concentration in that ash pollen? Well, this is really going to be dictated by the particular insecticide that's being applied and its method of application. So this is all stuff that I've, I've learned from working with Dan Herms. I have never controlled EEAB in, in, in my life, but he's told me quite a bit about this. And, and uh, Andrea Wade, an undergraduate student, worked with both Dan and, and myself, and so have a, some familiarity with how this is done. So there are the soil treatments, there are the trunk injections, and then there are the base, uh, systemic uh, basal trunk sprays. And these can include a number of different active ingredients, the neonicotinoids danotefiran and imidacloprid. Um, can be soil treatments or, or uh, basal trunk sprays, trunk injections. You can add in emamectin benzoate and azadiractin, and these are much more um, complex molecules of, that can be used to effectively control um, emerald ash borer. Um, and so here's just some pictures of uh, these neonicotinoid-containing insecticides. So soil-applied treatments um, pose obvious problems, at least from my point of view, for bee exposure, and it's not through the ash pollen at all, because if you have a soil-applied insecticide, um, you need to be very, really sure that it's only getting into the tree that you're trying to protect. But whenever you're applying something to the soil, inevitably there can be other things blooming um, that are growing in that soil that may be highly attractive to bees. And so I think the problem with soil-applied treatments is not necessarily ash getting into the ash pollen itself, but getting into the pollen of things like clovers or other weedy herbaceous plants may be growing around the base of the tree and may be available to take up that, uh, that insecticide. And the, obviously the mass of these, these small plants is much smaller than that tree. So uh, I think the potential for a really high dose is, is much greater um, with these, these soil applied treatments if there's anything growing around the base of that tree. Um, but the, the trunk injections are the kind that Dan has been most um, interested in. And so we were interested in, and he, he's actually got a, a plot here on OARDC uh, here in Worcester where he has been doing trunk injections for a number of years on, on ash trees. And so we had um, these trees with known application of both imidacloprid and emamectin benzoate uh, through triage or uh, I think it was Zytect. Um, and we could collect pollen from those trees and actually begin to answer this question of what is the concentration of these, these um, insecticides in the pollen produced by ash trees a year after uh, application. I mean, there, so there are a lot of different things that are, are currently available for use in controlling emerald ash spore. We only looked at two of them, um, imidacloprid and emamectin benzoate. Um, and uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at this insecticide options for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer um, by these authors here that has a full list of these different products. Um, so just based on the label application rate, um, I guess as a, as, a, as a first step before we had actually collected any pollen, the question is what kind of levels of insecticide contamination would you expect to see in ash pollen based on other studies of, of pollen residue in other plant systems. And one of the best studied plant systems is getting back to the seed treated corn um, issue because uh, the application rate of a neonicotinoid insecticide in seed treated corn is uh, 0.1 pounds per acre of active ingredient neonicotinoid. And we know from a number of studies now that when that corn is full grown, um, that pollen will be contaminated with this insecticide at at some level below 10 parts per billion. It's usually between five and 10 parts per billion uh, over a number of studies that have been done. It's, it's still detectable, but it's detectable at fairly low levels. 
So then the question is, how does this application rate of 0.1 pounds of, acre, uh, of active ingredient per acre compare with the, the kind of application rate that's being um, used for uh, emerald ash borer control? Obviously, corn and ash trees are very different plants, but at least this gives us a point to, um, to start from. So we can look at the per acre uh, use limits. And for imidacloprid and dinotefran, these two neonicotinoid insecticides, the annual acre use limit uh, for these is uh, 0.4 pounds of active ingredient per acre and 0.54 uh, pounds of active ingredient per acre. And this kind of calculation is made a little bit more complicated because it's you know, a rare situation where you have a, a solid acre of ash trees that you're going to treat. Usually it's just a few ash trees on a you know, residential lot with other trees and grass and other things uh, growing around it. And one of the criticisms is that it, it's possible to apply at this per acre use uh, a much higher dose to an individual tree because it would be, um, I mean, how, how do you define an acre here? These use limits uh, begin to be, become difficult to interpret in kind of a non-crop situation like this. Um, but given that, that challenge, what we'll go for it, we can do our back of the envelope calculation. And you know, based on the use rates uh, for corn and canola, where we've got good um, data on pollen contamination and, and maple, um, a tree in which imidacloprid has been, uh, has been exposed to imidacloprid, we found about five parts per billion of, of neonicotinoid in the maple pollen. So based on the high application rates and um, what we know from other plants, you could predict between 5 and 110 parts per billion of active ingredient neonicotinoid in the ash pollen just based on the pounds of active ingredient used per acre. Now the question is, so this 5 to 110, that's a pretty wide range, and is that a level that we should be concerned about? Well, to answer that question, we have to go look at the insecticide toxicity um, and the hazard part of this risk equation. Now I mentioned previously that you know many of the insecticides used on for emerald ash borer treatment are, are excellent insecticides. They kill insects. Um, honeybees happen to be insects, and so many of these insecticides are highly toxic to bees as well. Um, and there's a really good resource for looking up the intrinsic toxicity of different active ingredients. Um, the US EPA maintains this ecotox database which has the uh, results from all of the honeybee and other non-target organism testing that's been done over the last 40 years now, actually. Um, and they put all of these uh, toxicological data into this ecotox database. And it's not particularly easy to use, but um, once you figure it out, you can go here and look up the toxicity of any active ingredient that you may be interested in. This is something I do, I do fairly frequently. And here you can see that for uh, Apis mellifera, the honeybee, we can get the LD50 um, for, uh, this is imidacloprid here. Um, and you can see the actual um, micrograms of active ingredient per bee that will cause a 50% chance of mortality um, based in this given test. And obviously these tests have been performed in many different labs, many different places, and you can look at them all here uh, in this Ecotox database. And so from this database and from other sources, you can get an idea of the, the toxicity that these different insecticides used for emerald ash borer treatment uh, pose to, to honeybees. So here is uh, dinotefran and imidacloprid. The LD50s are in nanograms per bee. Um, these are exquisitely toxic insecticides. Um, Emmectin benzoate, however, doesn't seem any better. It's also a very good insecticide, uh, 3.5 nanograms per bee. Now, azadiractin has a much lower intrinsic toxicity uh, to bees. It's got a lower hazard to bees just based on its, its uh, LD50 toxicity, um, several orders of magnitude less. Um, but the, the uh, neonicotinoids and emmectin benzoate are all you know, highly toxic to bees. Now, so this is uh, how I am going to help interpret these exposure data and the um, toxicity data. 
on this kind of slide rule that I've got here. And this thing will require a little bit of explanation. Up here on the top, uh, we have the oral dose uh, for a bee uh, through pollen or, or through nectar. Here we've got the pollen concentration, and here we've got the nectar concentration. So oral dose is in nanograms per bee. Pollen concentration is in parts per billion. Nectar concentration is in parts per billion. Nectar is not so interesting here, but I use this as a nice uh, visual uh, guide to help interpret toxicity. And you can see that the, uh, these uh, PPBs go from one all the way up to 1,000 parts per billion for the pollen concentration. And it's on a log scale, which is the reason that these tick marks get closer together as you get further to the right. So that's a range of pollen concentrations uh, that's, that's possible to be measured. Now down here on the lower part of this slide, we have uh, three insecticides used for emerald ash borer control, imidacloprid on the top, dinotefran in the middle, and emimectin benzoate on the bottom. And because this is a slide rule, we can mark the LD50 here on the rightmost uh, tick mark that is measured here. So for imidacloprid, you can see that the LD50 in pollen, and this is based on data collected by US EPA as well, as, well as other um, sources, is in the range of about 400 parts per billion in pollen. Uh, um, it takes less than that in nectar, only about 14 parts per billion in nectar to kill bees. And the reason for this discrepancy between pollen and nectar concentrations and their toxicity to bees is the simple fact that bees eat a lot more nectar than they eat pollen. And so it takes a lot of more insecticide and pollen to actually get bees to die. So we got the LD50 on the right. Uh, down here, the, the, the solid line, and on the left is the LOC. Or that's the level of concern, which is a a uh, kind of a line in the sand that, that EPA uses to um, determine whether there is a, a, a real hazard to bees. This is based on their tier one testing protocols. So if it's below this level of concern, um, it, it may be possible for insecticide to get registered um, that without a, a huge amount of additional testing in a particular context. Um, so LOC is kind of a, a good guideline uh, above this, you're likely to see bee mortality. I think it, it's officially uh, above the LOC, you're likely to see 10% bee mortality. Below the LOC, less than 10% bee mortality. Now, this dashed line on the left here for imidacloprid is the, uh, the large sublethal effects range. And, and many of you may have heard about the, the striking sublethal effects that, that the neonicotinoid insecticides have on bees. Um, it kind of gets them drunk and um, immobile, but not yet dead, even at, at relatively low levels. And at, at very low levels, you may see, um, they may not be have this kind of stupor, but they may be uh, reduced in their ability to perform foraging tasks and their ability to return to the hive if they're exposed to, to levels of sublethal uh, concentrations. And so that dashed line here is the sublethal range down to the lowest level that um, anyone's been able to see some sort of sublethal effect. Here we've got 20% reduction in field performance. So um, based on our back of the envelope calculations for, um, for the neonicotinoids and for MMACT and benzoate, we do expect uh, you know, ash exposure to be in this range from 5 to 120, 110 uh, parts per billion in pollen. And you can see how that lines up to the effect likely to be observed with that level of imidacloprid exposure in bees. And you can see that, number one, this does not line up with the levels where you're expecting to see acute mortality. Um, you're not even up to the level where you're likely to see uh, very low levels of mortality. We are squarely in the sublethal range here, just based on our calculations. Now, we, so here's this range here uh, that we're predicting based on, on calculations. So, with Dan and Andrea, we actually collected some of the ash pollen um, from these ash trees. And ash trees produce an astonishingly large amount of pollen. So we just you know, cut off some branches and put them in a cardboard box and allowed the pollen to, to be released and then collected it in that cardboard box and uh, sent that off for uh, pesticide residue testing. And we, we did this in two years. And in the first year, in 2015, we had a number of samples from uh, several different trees. And the average 
concentration that we observed in the pollen that, that uh, Dan had used the trunk injection on the prior year was about 60 parts per billion. So right in the middle of that range that we had predicted. Now you see here, again, this is not a levels that would be likely to cause acute B mortality, but it may be causing some sort of sublethal effect on the bees' uh, ability to perform work in the colony. And it's right in the range that we had predicted. Now in 2016, we sent off another sample. Um, this is to a different lab, and we got much lower concentrations in, in 2016, in the second year. Uh, we got uh, less than 10 parts per billion uh, imidacloprid in the, uh, in the pollen that we tested that year. Um, this may be differences in the methodology used by the different labs, or there may have been you know, factors that, that caused the uh, ash trees to, to produce less um, insecticide in the pollen in the second year. Now, the second year, um, though this is also within the range that we had predicted, um, in, in 2016, we also looked at the presence of emamectin benzoate in uh, pollen, and Dan had some trunk-injected trees uh, with emamectin benzoate the previous year, and we again collected uh, branches from those, those ash trees. And we did not actually detect any emamectin benzoate in the, in the pollen that we collected from the trees, though um, the level of detection for emamectin benzoate is, is somewhat higher than for the neonicotinoids. So all we can say is that if it is in there, it's at a level less than 10 parts per billion, which is our level of detection. Though, as you can see, based on the, the kind of slide rule here, even at 10 parts per billion, this is substantially below the LD50 that would be likely to cause obvious mortality and well below the level of concern up here. Um, you're down in a range where you would be unlikely to see any sort of harmful effects, in my opinion. We don't know anything about uh, sublethal effects in emamectin benzoate, um, but even if it was similar to imidacloprid, we're still below the range where, where people have seen sublethal effects in the neonicotinoids. So we can detect uh, imidacloprid and likely other neonicotinoids in, in pollen of ash trees that have been treated with uh, a trunk injection of these uh, emerald ash borer control products. We cannot detect emamectin benzoate in ash trees that were treated with, uh, with triage, or I think it was triage in this case. So uh, why is this? Um, well, it could be, I mean, it could be that uh, our level of, of detection is just not that good with emamectin benzoate because it's a, it's a little more challenging molecule to detect. Or one other explanation is that these are very different molecules. So here we have imidacloprid on the left here, which is a fairly small molecule. Uh, its molecular weight is 255. Um, whereas emamectin benzoate is four times as big, uh, about 1,008 um, grams per mole for emamectin benzoate, a much larger molecule. And our, our hypothesis is that it just gets bound up uh, in the wood or elsewhere in the tree and can't make it into the, the pollen um, when that pollen is produced, while, while imidacloprid and the other neonicotinoids are much smaller and could potentially um, get into the pollen. At least that's our, our best guess at the moment for explaining these results, why imidacloprid was present and imidacloprid benzoate was not. Um, that, not to open a whole can of worms here, but because we saw exposure in the sublethal range, I should probably talk a little bit about sublethal exposure. So sublethal uh, toxicity, as I mentioned before, is, is not deadly toxicity. It's the sort of thing, think of it as uh, intoxication, you know. These bees are drunk uh, from the imidacloprid and they can't perform work as well and they can't, that may have long-term effects on the colony health, potentially. And there have been a great number of studies on you know, sublethal effects on behavior. I like this one by uh, Christoph Schneider back in, in 2012 because he's got some really nice illustrations here. They used uh, you know, RFID tags on the bees, trained them to a feeder, and then looked at the bees ability to navigate from that feeder back to the hive. And, you know, they found a short-term effect of neonicotinoids um, on the ability of these bees to, to go out and forage in this situation. But it was at, at pretty high concentrations, higher concentrations than we're seeing here in, in ash pollen for sure. And it was really only on a short-term basis. Um, 
Others have looked at, you know, the loss of foragers and, and this nice paper uh, by Henry et al. back in 2012, they found that bees would, would get lost coming back to the hive if they were exposed to, um, to, to uh, thymethoxum, another neonicotinoid, in the range that we're seeing in the ash pollen here. So it's possible that there is some sort of sublethal effect occurring in these bees that consume this, this ash pollen. Um, that is not going to result in obvious mortality and is actually going to be really hard to measure on the colony level at all. You know, measuring homing failure is not the sort of thing that you can just go out and look at a colony and, and observe. This, is, this requires, uh, again, RFID tagging and really, uh, really studying the colony to detect this kind of sublethal effect on the colony level. Um, and a lot of this is, goes into using colony population models and, and you can you know, change the efficiency of foraging and look to see how that reduced foraging efficiency reduces the amount of food coming into the colony and that will have long, potentially have long-term population level effects because the bees can then not rear as many new bees. Um, it, it gets really complicated really fast when you try to interpret um, you know, these sublethal effects on colony success. And this is an area I mean, this is from 2014. We still don't have this figured out, and we probably won't have it figured out, my guess is, for another five to 10 years, how sublethal effects can really be modeled in a population model like this to, to really understand what they might be doing to, to a, a real field-level colony. So um, to summarize, here is our risk equation again. We've gone over the, the hazard. Um, these things are definitely toxic to bees um, at pretty astonishingly low levels, actually. Um, we've established that, that bees do collect ash pollen, even when they have other things available, and that the insecticide is present in ash pollen. But that presence is not at a level that is likely to cause any sort of acute bee mortality. And ash pollen, in our study, was only a quarter of the pollen that bees were, were collecting at any given time, so that concentration will be further diluted by all the other things that bees are foraging on. I mean, this may be a, a more severe situation if there's only ash trees present, and, but I don't know where that would be a realistic scenario um, anywhere in the springtime because, you know, in the springtime when ash is blooming, it seems just about everywhere, there's always something else blooming that would serve to dilute the concentration of, of ash, uh, emerald ash borer insecticides present in the pollen. So there is risk here. But in my estimation, it's not a large risk. Um, it's something we need to be aware of and is probably a, a topic that requires further study. So, you know, in summary, um, yeah, we're, we're down here in the no effect range, maybe some effect of our dose makes the poison wedge here. Um, certainly not going to cause catastrophe with the kinds of exposure bees are, are receiving. Now, then the question is, um, is this something that should be, should be regulated? And according to the, uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, um, EPA is tasked with preventing unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. And I guess it's an open question whether these emerald ash borer treatments are having an unreasonable adverse effect uh, on the environment, on the honeybees and other pollinators in the environment. Um, and in this calculation is a cost-benefit analysis. Um, and it could be, um, this is not as with human toxicity, where there is no cost-benefit analysis, that it, it may be um, justifiable to have some sublethal effects on honeybees, but maybe the, the benefit of preserving these ash trees outweighs the, what appears to be a pretty minor cost of maybe a little bit of lost colony productivity um, as a result of this exposure. Um, I should note that this is if we were talking about this in Europe, it would be a very different story. Europe's approach to risk assessment on, uh, for pesticides is, is quite different based on the precautionary principle. So my recommendations uh, was that, would be the soil applied treatments are probably the riskiest kind of treatment, because, mostly because they have the potential to get into other things that are, are far more attractive and much less massive, um, where bees may be able to get much higher concentrations. Uh, it's probably a good idea to maximize the time of application maximize the amount of time between application and ash bloom to allow that stuff to uh, dissipate, to be broken down um, before the ash tree blooms. And so what Dan was recommending is that you treat ash trees immediately after ash bloom 
So you got essentially a full year um, before the ash tree blooms again. We now know that neonicotinoids appear to show up in ash pollen, um, but emamectin benzoate does not. And this may be a recommendation that emamectin benzoate could be um, pose less of an exposure risk to bees, though I, I, I would like to see more uh, replication on this to see if we really can detect emamectin benzoate uh, or not in, in ash pollen. And so that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer any questions now. All right. Thank you, Reed. That's a lot of work you guys have done. <laughs> okay, let me see here. Make sure I get the, all the questions. Okay. All right. Um, if you find oleaceae, does that also include fringe tree and lilac or the DN or does the DNA technique distinguish among the species? Well, we, we can distinguish better among this. Well, we can distinguish at the gen, at the uh, generic level now between uh, genus. Um, but we are we we did some additional sequencing with that ash pollen. We are quite confident that that was fraxinus in um, those samples that RBs were collecting. Um, But they may be foraging on other things as well. I don't. I have never seen them foraging on lilacs. I don't know that they like lilacs particularly. Okay. All right. Um, how do you get the five to one hundred and ten parts per billion of neonics in ash pollen if you get five parts per billion for maple at 0.4 pounds AIAC, and the range of application rates is point to 0.54 for ash. Um, let me go back to that. Let's see. Um, it was based on the lower application rates in these other plants that we have uh, pollen concentration data for. Um, so I was obviously that five uh, parts per billion establishes the low range, but it could be that ash is more similar to corn and canola than it is to a maple. So, let's, so I wanted to, to make an upper limit. So that's the upper plausible limit of what might be present in ash pollen, um, assuming that ash and maple physiology is not exactly the same. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Have you tried to check if emamectin benzoate is in flowers in general and what type of method or technique is being used to detect it? So um, we only were looking at ash pollen. I don't, I haven't, this is the only real contact I've had with emamectin benzoate. Um, so I don't, I don't know. There may be other people other, elsewhere working on concentrations in other flowers, um, but I, I don't know of any work on that. Um, as far as how this was detected, this was detected with uh, uh, LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry at the um, Guelph Lab Services. University of Guelph Lab Services in, uh, in Guelph, Canada. And I went with them because they already have a method for detecting emamectin benzoate. Um, the other lab that many people may be aware of is the, uh, the lab in uh, the USDA AMS lab in Gastonia, North Carolina, which does similar kind of testing. Um, but they do not, at the time, they did not have emamectin benzoate on their menu of pesticides that they could detect. So they would have needed to make a new method to detect emamectin benzoate for this study. Okay. Um, if these applications are only done every few years, do you think that would have an impact on exposure as well? Um, absolutely. I, I think, I mean, we can assume that the concentration is going to go down over time. So, you know, this was in one year after application is what this 60 parts per billion we measured was. Um, I think it would be safe to assume that would go down over time. Um, so that would, that would be one way to, to help reduce exposure of, of bees and other non-targets to, to this insecticide. All right. Um, is it difficult to imagine how MBEN could get into other flowers 
oh, I'm sorry. It says, it is difficult to imagine how MBEN could get into other flowers if it is injected into ash trees. That was from Dr. Sadoff, I think, in, in response to the uh, question about amomectin benzoate in, in other flowers besides ash. Okay, I am not seeing any more questions right now, um, but wow, this is great. In, yeah, very interesting presentation. Thank you. People are thanking you for your work and, uh, and appreciate you uh, giving us all this information, Reed. It's been great. Um, this is always really helpful. We, we get so many questions on, on the bees and, 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 you know, some kind, and the and the insecticides and what's happening with ash trees and that kind of thing. So this is good information to know and be able to, you know, you know more definitively tell people what's going on with that kind of thing when you're, when you're trying to work with ash trees. So thank you so much well, again. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for, for uh, listening to this, to this work. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks like a lot of work. That's, that was very, you know, Looks like you've done a, a you've been very busy in the last two years. <laughs> so, oh, oh, I have one person that says, has any similar work done been done with hemlock? Ooh, hemlock. I I don't know. It would be the the honeydew question there. Um, oh, okay. Would, yeah, I don't know if gosh, I should look that up though. That would, that would be good, interesting to compare because um, obviously concentrations in that honeydew um, could be much more potentially damaging than than pollen just because bees eat more. Um, nectar than they do pollen. That's a good good suggestion. <laughs> okay, and um, I will just for those of you that are participating today, I I will put um, Reed's email in the letter that I email that I send you in case you have other questions that you might think of after. So, um, well, with that, I would like to say thanks again, and with everyone else, um, thank you for attending, and I will be um, ending the meeting here and. Everyone, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.